we shouldn't be referred to as informal carers. We shouldn't even be referred to as peers. We really are um, people that have walked through fire um, and we've become experts only through doing that. And I wouldn't wish it on anybody. I would not wish this job on anybody. You know, this is not a choice. This is something that um, we have to do. You know, to keep our loved ones alive, we have to do it, to keep them well, to keep the community well, you know, we, we want, but it's it's a lot to shoulder. The police have now been, um, have changed and they will not come to anybody with a mental health crisis, no matter what kind of crisis it is, uh, unless, again, there is risk to um, a life. So now we don't even have the police to call if we are worried for our loved one's safety. Worry is not enough to be able to call out the only people we could call. So um, our arsenal uh, to protect our loved one, which is really what we want to do. Um, sure, we want to keep the community safe and we want to keep ourselves safe, but as a carer of an SMI, your focus is always on your loved one. What do we do? And uh, I think it's a very, very good question and it needs to be looked at on, um, on a political level. This needs to be looked at it on the very, very highest levels. What do we do? Who do we call? Um, how do we get them safe in a place of safety? Because the home is often not a place of safety for anybody when somebody is um, in psychosis, hearing voices. Hello and welcome to the Humanistic Community Mental Health Podcast. My name is Dr. Hassan Malik. I'm a specialty trainee based here in the Central and Northwest London Trust. This is a quality improvement project. The goal of this project is to improve understanding of community mental health services for both my trainee colleagues as well as the wider public. Before we begin, I just want to say that although myself and my guests are part of organizations, any views expressed are our own and any medical discussions we have are general discussions which may or may not be suitable for your case. I have with me today Penny, who is going to be my expert, so to speak, today. She has she has a background in teaching and academics, and she's also an advocate for not only for the person she cares about, but also is involved in making communities of carers and advocating for them. So I'm really pleased to have her here. Do you want to say say hello, Penny? How are you doing today? Hi, Hassan, and thanks so much. Uh, for having me on your podcast. I'm really excited about it. And uh, yeah, it's a great opportunity to talk about uh, my own role as a carer, but also um, the carers and the groups that I'm involved with, mm -hmm. um, in particular uh, with CNWL. Yeah, you've actually done some research uh, from beforehand. So I think you've come well prepared. You've even asked uh, com your community if there's any specific things they would like anyone listening to this uh, podcast, uh, what they should know. So I'm I'm excited to hear about the voices from from there as well. Yes, I think um, in any setting, in particular in health settings, that uh, more than one voice is necessary. We need to have many many voices because uh, each patient and each carer and each trust is so different and so varied. Um, so I think that was probably important for me to do is to, to kind of you know, do a little call out to all my carer friends out there. Uh, they're all carers of SMIs as well, which is um, people with serious mental illness, uh, which is quite different, I think. Uh, we have our own uh, specific set of problems, and I think I'd like to feed those back and um, hopefully uh, enlighten people to what our, um, our roles actually are. Yeah, and I, I think that's um, that's very welcome. I know that for a lot of the things that I'm taught as part of my training is that there is an understanding that involvement of carers 
leads to better outcomes for patients. A couple of the most cited ones is things like relapse prevention and adherence to medication. But I'm hoping today we can go beyond these like research papers and go into, uh, I like uh, the word you use. I think the word you used before was visceral, into the visceral parts of it. Yeah, yeah. I think um, quite often uh, when you're dealing with um, a large organization, such as a trust, um, a mental health trust, I know CNWL is not specifically a mental health trust. Um, most trusts tend to be just mental health, whereas CNWL, I think, um, is a bit diluted because uh, they, do, they deal with other things things other than mental health mm -hmm. so um but as as we were saying before when we were having a discussion it tends to come across uh for people like myself in the community as a little bit corporate there's a lot of jargon involved um you often feel that you're kind of a number um and at least uh, your loved one is kind of a number and um it's often seems like a bit of a tick box um, exercise uh, care uh, from the trust. So I think I'd kind of like to unpick that a little bit and see, you know, where that kind of care helps and, and where it maybe doesn't. Like there's a lot of fancy terms like co-production, co-design, person-centered care, but then the that kind of dehumanizing effect from what I'm 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 hearing from you is it's even suffered by patients where they feel that okay this person is just going through a ment going through a checklist in their head and I'm just another patient to them and mm. not not a person with their own story. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, when you're dealing with, uh, CNWL has 8,000 um, employees. So not all of those, of course, will be um, clinicians. Uh, there'll be quite a lot of admin. I think it's very top heavy, to be honest. So patient-centered care within that uh, is quite hard to dig out. Um, you've got a lot of rules and regulations. You've got a corporate environment. And I think um, as a carer, and I'm assuming, uh, well, I kind of know from personal feedback as a, um, a patient or, or what um, they like to call uh, an end user, I think. Uh, or service user. <laughs> um, service user. You see, to me, the, la the language in that is kind of says it's all about the service and you're just a user of that service. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds transactional that, okay, we will provide you with something mm. in return for something, you know. So, uh, yeah. Very, very transactional. Yeah, you're completely right. And I think within this kind of environment, this corporate environment, mm. where you've got, a, a you know, got a board of trustees, you've got all the directors, then you've got all the admin underneath that, you've got the middle managers, and then you come down to the people at the, not quite the coalface, but maybe coalface within the wards. Yeah. yeah. Um, not, none of them are actually uh, having day-to-day -day care mm. of people with serious mental illness. Yeah. Um, and the rules that they set, or, you know, that I, I'm sure it comes from a great place, you know, I'm, I'm sure it does. But I'm um, uncertain as to whether a corporate um, body mm -hmm. or apparatus can function um, in a way that is visceral, that does have a visceral response. Yeah, yeah. You know, with, with the theory that they're using, they're using medical theory, they're using kind of absolutes. And people, people can't really fit in very well, and particularly ill people, because they're all so different. You know, their presentations are all so different. And carers, carers are kind of attached to that. I think, yeah, I think there is some, at least on, uh, at least the strategy or the idea is there. Like I was just doing a little bit of reading to kind of educate myself about, okay, who is talking about things like uh, co-production or co-design, which um, just for the listener, if you're unaware, it means kind of uh, sharing the power balance and kind of b both parties such as the clinician and the patient both kind of being open to their vulnerabilities and um, co co so co-production would be a, a small set but co-design would mean that the service user just to use that term is involved with how policy is made which I think is a nice ideal but then I think now where we are in in this moment is kind of I feel um 
it needs to go from an idea to an effective effective solution effective action um mm-hmm. so i'm i'm hoping today um what we talk about i hope um we can also reach some people who are um who would be interested in making those key changes and maybe can g- gain some uh, insight into what that really means and how that would really be effective to work with mm-hmm. carers and work with patients mm. Yeah, I think the rhetoric is there at the moment. Uh, There's been some small baby steps towards involvement of carers. Um, But because uh, we talked before, of course, about jargon, um, you know, there's a kind of a, as you know, kind of a gatekeeping element to that, um, accepting that carers are uh, experts by experience, which is one of our own terms mm-hmm. um, that comes out of Triangle of Care, which was um, introduced in 2009, whereby the clinician, the carer, and the patient are all um, contributing to uh, the care plan. Um, sadly, uh, this wasn't picked up by every trust, and I think CNWL in particular picked it up around 2013. Um, I stand to be corrected on that date, but I'm pretty sure that's correct. Um, And it it is uh, in our um, experience and in other carers of SMI's experience in other trusts, it is not implemented, certainly not widely. Um, Certain trusts implemented a little bit more. But um, as you say, that's, um, it's... uh, It's an academic way of um, introduction, introducing um, co-working or co-production, I think you called it. Yes. It's um, in terms of the outcomes, it's still all talk. It's not that much action. Um, It hasn't really changed the um, environment very much. And I think um, the new introduction uh, and rollout of open dialogue by Russell Razak, Dr. Russell Razak, uh, that's currently happening. Also, baby steps, there's an awful lot of um, employees <laughs> to roll this out to. Mm. And of course, carers need to know about it too. Yeah. Um, I'm just like that l- is... literally kind of as Google open dialogue while you were spe- speaking. <laughs> so, so it says. Um, <laughs> Just from a, I, I'm sure anyone listening that also just like Google that be the first thing they do. So open dialogue is a family and social network approach to first episode psychosis care. Uh, it's a way of working with people who are diagnosed with schizophrenia and other forms of psychosis and who may hear voices. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, um, I think uh, I've done a couple of uh, weeks of training now uh, on learning about this, yeah, and um, which breaks down the hierarchy which you naturally have in kind of corporate environment. So um, at the moment, uh, the the corporate based, I guess, trusts are asking for carer input. They're asking for grassroots information to come up within the corporation. We all kind of know if we've done any kind of management studies that um, the only good information comes from the ground. Uh, You know, top down um, information is kind of a bit detached from what we really need. So it's great that um, trusts are now asking for care of voice, but um, you have to negotiate <laughs> the corporate environment, mm. which we, we really mainly are not part of. Um, so with open dialogue, what it does is it actually reduces all um, hierarchy. So you might be sitting in a meeting for training, for instance, if you're being trained in open dialogue, yeah. you might be trained with a consultant as a as a carer. I might be sitting in a in a training with a consultant, with an admin person, with um, a secretary, or with a cleaner, with um, a director, and they might all be in that same training to allow people that normally are kind of you know, on the top hierarchy, so yeah. to speak, yeah. to kind of come down to earth and to listen and to have a visceral response. And this um, 
this way of thinking has come out of uh, practice in Finland and then uh, kind of spread throughout uh, Scandinavia, whereby um, people with so-called schizophrenia, but psychosis, mm -hmm. voices, things like that, yeah. um, when they're taken to hospital initially, uh, they wouldn't be medicated for about three months. Wow. Um, and th instead, they would have listening therapy. And that's basically what open dialogue is. It's learning to listen. And it's learning to respond in a very visceral way to what you hear. Yeah. And so it brings the body back into the equation. Um, it brings the patient uh, and all of the people the patient affects or the, their illness affects all of the people that are attached to that patient, it brings them down to that same visceral experience. And so we have more compassion, we have more understanding, and often um, the theory goes, and it's been borne out actually in Finland and other uh, places where this has been rolled out, I think for about 20 years, um, that medication is not always necessary. Um, connection with the person, um, listening, actively listening, responding, and looking at your own response often helps you to be very, very compassionate. And um, it's a revelation, especially for carers. And I know that this podcast is about carers. And it, for me, it's been an incredible revelation that we are on the same level we all want the same thing. We can understand and probably even understand more because we have a natural um, visceral response to our loved ones because we often live with them. We hope to live with them. Um, uh, whereas a clinician or somebody who's kind of removed, if they're um, maybe a nurse in the community treatment team, or if they're a clinician in the hospital, might only see that person once a month for an hour. So um, I think coming together, there's a continuity of care also with open dialogue. So you, that person now, now the way it stands, uh, a person who's suffering would get better, come out of hospital after sometimes long, long periods of time, but they cannot go back to that same clinician. They can't go back to the same team that's helped them to get better. There's no continuity of care. And I think um, I think we all agree that this kind of illness uh, comes from trauma. It's trauma um, and it needs trauma-based care. So when you're changing all the time, changing where you live, changing who your cl clinician or nurse is, um, you, this is disturbing and re-traumatizing often. So uh, open dialogue kind of deals with all of those things that we we kind of all know, but the system that we have right now doesn't really deal very well with. So the uh, agreed on the just while you were speaking i was thinking that yeah so for continuity of care it would be essential to kind of have a carer to understand just a different kind of perspective okay how is this person usually is this current crisis as bad as it was before um i know mm -hmm. that we like even for me like um uh, I rotate every six months as part of my training. So mm -hmm. I do try to, um, when, whenever I'm leaving, if I'm seeing someone, then uh, a patient, I do tell them like, okay, it's going to be a different doctor next month mm. because, um, you know, this is the end of my thing, of my training. And it's always, mm -hmm. and that's a common theme, which I've also observed. It's like doctor wears, you know, it's, we just built a relationship <laughs> You know, and we I was kind of vulnerable with you and I feel like we work together and, and now it's like okay, goodbye. Um Yeah. So so yeah, so there is kind of when you're talking I wouldn't necessarily compare it specifically to trauma, but it is kind of a sh shifting uh, shifting mm. people, you know. So it is kind of in, in a way someone is leaving you again. Uh, I think um there's an awful lot of loss uh, around um, serious mental illness. Uh, carers feel it a great deal um, from my groups and what I uh, read on my groups and what's been fed back to me. And what I've also experienced initially when you first realize that your loved one is experiencing um, altered states, 
um, the loss, especially if they're young, I think, the loss of their future, the loss of your own independence, the loss really of their entire life and yours is, um, oh, it's palpable. So um, any further losses that you have, and often, um, you know, something that really needs addressing is um, loved ones being sent a long way away from their carers and their families to find beds. Um, this is a, a massive, um, takes a massive toll on the family and the particular carer, because we want to be able to spend as much time as possible loving our loved one, letting them know that they're loved, um, conversing with them, listening to them, because quite often, I think through um, shortage of staffing, um, potentially um, staff not understanding that um, these are not um, your average patient. These are people that really need an awful lot of care care you know like loving care not just you know changing a sheet or um although that's really nice as well but <laughs> you know there's uh, there's a, there's so much involved with the care and it tends to become very medicalized um one of the one of the carers fed back to me um that they would uh something that they would like me to uh, to say yeah uh, and to feedback um, could you emphasize that each patient service user is an individual? They're not the psychotic in room three or the bipolar in room six. They are our loved ones with their individual whole, ho hopes and dreams, albeit seemingly shattered for the time being. Oh, and remind them that we don't always understand mental health jargon, especially at the beginning. And if they could take time to explain it, if they can. So from that, you can imagine that um, our loved ones are taken, they're institutionalized, and they become, um, they become their illness. Uh, often we don't have access to them. Access is very difficult to get, especially if the patient has moved a very long way away. But even in my case, um, the hospital is just down the road. I, I felt very lucky that we had the hospital very close. But gaining entry is very, very difficult because um, carers are seen to be, I think, sometimes uh, with the, e the ears and the voice of our loved ones because they're in a state of psychosis often um, and their, their thinking can be very muddled at that time. So often they hear things um, and they get them wrong or they get them confused or they, they've heard something completely different with not having the carer there who knows them very, very well, how they might respond, um, what would make them walk out, what would really annoy them and upset them. Uh, by keeping the carer out, it's kind of, I don't know, it's almost like making a rod for your own back. I, I don't understand why carers are kept out so much of the treatment, and that's in the wards. Um, it can also be in the community, but less so in the community. Yeah, I, I mean, my, my experiences, although I feel um, I can talk about my own experiences uh, uh, mainly, is that, yeah, the jargon definitely, uh, even for me joining from a different trust to this trust, I used to work in the Northwest, and uh, like the first couple of meetings, I was like, what? is this stuff you know there was a lot of jargon technical stuff abbreviations and then i feel like i annoyed my colleagues a little bit because every time i'd stop them like okay what is for example smi wh mm -hmm. what what do you mean the amp and um mm -hmm. so so i had to which is a proof mental health professional by the way if, <laughs> if someone doesn't know <laughs> but um but yeah there is kind of um I, I think it goes a little deeper. Um, uh, it goes a little deeper than that when when you're saying, you know, that someone's like labeled as the bipolar or the schizophrenic or something like that. Um, I, I think there it it's a little bit safer for a mental health professional to kind of to not get um, like it's scary to be um, to for it to dawn on you that, OK, this is a whole person with their whole life and, you know, they have families, they have all of this. So I can also see I, I don't know if I'm sounding defensive, but I, I'm just trying to like if for for me, sometimes I have to be 
it's it's uh, it's a lot of responsibility as well that this is not just you know a disease i'm treating with some medication this is the whole person with their whole life and a family mm. and so many connections that all of them have to be uh, taken care of this is not just um mm. it's it's kind of like easier and simpler if it's just a schizophrenia and not you know someone's mm. son someone's daughter someone's um yeah. someone's parent I think that's um, a great thing to hear uh, coming from you as a cl clinician uh, because it helps to understand why clinicians can sometimes, not always, sometimes uh, feel very, very disconnected from their patients and their families. And that, that helps me to understand. And um, leading on from that, I think it helps me to understand why carers find their job so, so hard, because um, emotionally we're already attached to that person. Um, we cannot uh, actually become objective. Personally, I don't think anybody can be totally objective with another human being. But um, I know that uh, in a clinical setting, it probably does help to have fewer emotions around what's going on. But as uh, most carers, we're mainly parents um, or close. So it might be um, a spouse, it could be a brother or sister, a sibling, um, but mainly we're parents. And I think um, there's no way that we can extricate ourselves from that role. So we kind of have a multiple role. Um, and I think, that's uh, for even for um, nurses on the wards, for admin people in particular who are not working uh, at the cold face, so to speak. Um, it's impossible for anybody to know what our role is really like and all the um, emotions and, um, you know, feelings of loss, feelings of grief. We're constantly in grief, um, feelings of being unheard. Um, uh, just completely dismissed or even completely invisible uh, or uh, even worse, attacked um, because we're intervening in, um, in clinical settings or having our say or mainly because we know that we know that person so well. We are experts by experience and we need more than just to say those words, we need to be taken, we need to be asked, we need to be able to support and help, you know, um, somebody who's very, very vulnerable, usually, and very, very delicate at yeah. that time when they're in the wards. Yeah, I can, mm. I can hear uh, the, the emotion and the passion in your voice. Um, I know you're, we, you're also here like you said, as an expert by experience, do you want to share your story as well and how um, and how being a mum for uh, someone with serious mental illness, what your journey has been like? Well, it's been long and hard. Um, my son uh, started to have quite unusual behaviours around um, puberty, so probably around 13. Uh, he became quite erratic sometimes. Sometimes, uh, you know, I was kind of, I kind of put it down to uh, teenage, <laughs> teenage behavior, but I think it was a little more than that, uh, looking back. But at the time, and so many carers say this, they didn't realize they were carers. Um, and with serious mental illness, I think some people don't know this, there's no diagnosis until the age of 19. From the ages um, of uh, this illness starting to show up, in our case, from 14 to 19, that's a very long time, uh, where there's really no care, um, there's no diagnosis, there's no care, there's no medication really no support and no help so uh, sorry um, just to just to understand uh is it is it specific i i know that young people can have like bipolar or schizophrenia but is it is it that term like specifically serious mental illness which is only applied to adults uh yes i think before that it can be diagnosed as things like attachment disorder uh, um they're very reluctant to because diagnose the, yeah because the brain is forming mm -hmm. your brain continues to develop yeah. till your late teens yeah. and early 20s uh okay yeah so that that makes 
sense. Although for you, I think that it started, like you said, uh, roundabout when you're already expecting some changes around puberty and you're like, okay, is this, uh, <laughs> you know, is this how it is for everyone? Is this, <laughs> you know? So yeah. So, yeah, so at what point were you like, okay, uh, no, this, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, this needs some professional help. Yes. Um, well, it was it was fairly obvious, actually. I got a call from one of my son's friends uh, who said, um, your, your son is outside of our house and mum's had to lock the door and he's um, carrying a spade with him and he's having all these unusual behaviours and um, he doesn't seem to be very aware of what he's saying and doing and would you come and get him, please? So I got in the car and went to get him. We you know, I had a struggle to leave the spade behind because he'd become very attached to that spade. And I thought, gosh, there's something going on here that I'm not familiar with at all. Um, both of us, uh, both my my son's friend's mother and, and myself, would both have a teaching background. So, you know, we're used to teenage behaviour and we both knew that this was way beyond anything that we'd seen before. Um, my son's normally cheerful calm very helpful quite a quiet person and he was I would say now I know the words and the terms to use I would say he was quite manic um, but anyway we finally got him to a hospital which was very very difficult uh, not knowing what was going on and not knowing what to do and so our first port of call was the police and always has been um, it's one of the things I think that it would be really worthwhile discussing, I think um, I think the general population would probably say, well, just call the hospital and get them in there. It's not easy. Usually your loved one, um, especially if you are a mother, is usually bigger and stronger than you. Um, you cannot force somebody, uh, even legally can't force somebody, um, and you can, you know, they could lash out at you. Um, there's all sorts of kind of things that maybe the most most people would not consider that we have to think about quite a lot uh, in terms of getting help. So you called the police? Yes, um, I had to call the police. I didn't even know why or what to say, what I was calling for. I just said, I think my son is extremely unwell. He's been missing for rather a long time, uh, just kind of missing um, on the run, really. Uh, he he was very, very vulnerable at the time, obviously very unwell, but we didn't know he was unwell. Um, he believed that he'd had implants, which is a very common um it's a very common thing for people with paranoia to feel that they've been implanted with something and somebody is able to track them. So that means that they don't hold on to their phones. They often either ditch or break their phones so that nobody can track them. Same with a lot of their laptops, things like that. That's ongoing with people with um, paranoia. Uh, my son went on the run. We didn't know where he was. I was working closely with missing persons. So I was able to call them and say, I found him although he did kind of come to my attention. He had um, he had been popping up all over the place presenting at A&E, where you would think um, they would immediately see, you know, being medical people, they would immediately see that there was an issue, a mental health issue, and he would be channeled through to the right places. But that didn't happen. Um, that's not a way in to getting mental health help, sadly. It should be, but that's not working very well in our experience and in other carers' experiences. So maybe that could be something that could be uh, beefed up rather a lot in terms of getting people care that they really seriously need and that the public really need them to get as well. So he was uh, fronting to ask for an M MRI. I don't think um, that also the general population realise that um, with psychosis, the person who's experiencing it, for them, it is so true what they are, what they're feeling, what they're experiencing. And there's a certain way of handling that when you're a carer. Um, most people would say, don't be so silly. The, the government is not chasing you. No, that person is not from 
the FBI, uh, you know, and you would kind of argue with them. But as you as you've been a carer for quite a long time, it, there's a lot of research that you have to do because nobody teaches you this stuff. There's a certain way of dealing with somebody who's experiencing delusions, um, who's experiencing paranoia, and that is to not fully agree, but to listen and to listen with empathy and compassion and and feedback to them. Gosh, that must be, a, a, you must be feeling very, very frightened right now. And I think if we had more compassion and exercised that, um, then people could potentially be led to get more help um, rather than to feel so isolated, so stigmatized. Yeah. And people to be so frightened of them. Really, they are much more vulnerable than they are aggressive. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that, that it would be really nice if the media would join in <laughs> yeah. and let people know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think e even for me as a professional, I, I also struggle with, um, I like to call them delusions. Um, mm -hmm. or And I'm like, okay, this person is completely convinced that uh the mi5 are doing experiments on them i'm mm -hmm. like okay is it my role to say no or is mm -hmm. it but usually the answer lies somewhere in the middle which is um, you know to understand it to understand contextually if you mm -hmm. are convinced that that is happening how would it make you feel and yes. kind of work from there to gently nudge towards okay can is there any other explanation mm -hmm for it possibly but it's um it needs some patience and some grace maybe um absolutely yeah i think grace is a very good word there um and i think it's kind of lacking um in most settings mm. and even for carers we have to learn to do those things as well i mean it, with poor behavior i know because i'm a teacher of a teenage or was a teacher of teenage um people uh boundaries are really really important so of course the first thing i did when my son so-called misbehaved was to set very firm boundaries and i was supported by obviously you know i went to the i went to cams i went to um social services uh, to sorry, get help cams is the child and adolescent yeah. mental health service yes sorry yes, yeah um, okay yeah, just no just for yeah. the listener you're fine yes <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah um and I was supported in putting in firmer boundaries, uh, but with uh, serious mental illness, boundaries can feel to the patient or the person suffering um, like opposition. It's like saying, you don't understand what I'm going through. And I think uh, we battled with that for quite a long time. Um, none of these things are made apparent, even to clinicians. As you say, um, how how do you deal with somebody who's so incredibly convinced? And what I found was um, if you dig down and if you know that person really well, there's a grain of truth in there. Um, when my son was saying these uh, all of the people in the world are like robots, I kind of thought to myself, well, actually, it is becoming a little bit like that. When you're on the phone to somebody, quite often you're having to talk to a robot or you're talking to people that are reading from a sheet, you know, that you're not really conversing and our humanity is kind of being taken away yeah, in that way or it's not being recognized maybe. Yeah, we're seeing that on the cusp of an AI revolution as well, uh, the artificial intelligence that's now becoming Absolutely. an everyday. So yeah, so it rings true in some senses. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, one thing also I notice um, within the groups uh, I belong to, um, and they're all parents of people with psychosis and um, other serious mental illnesses, is that um, most people with these illnesses tend to be extremely sensitive people. They um, are often very, very gentle, um, often uh, very, very clever also. They're not people who are suffering from learning difficulties. Uh, they can often be autistic, mind you. Um, so 
it's a shame in a way that we treat people with SMIs, serious mental illnesses, in a kind of throwaway fashion often within our society, not, not just within the medical um, setting, but within our society that we, we stigmatise them and we don't see their humanity. And I think you're right, with AI coming along, that's going to be even more so. From from what you're explaining, I just did a little bit of uh, reading as well on surveys and research that has been done with carers by different people. Okay, what, what do you feel you need the most or what do you think is a thing that's lacking in the services? Um, mm -hmm. So what, one of the things was to... Um, what constitutes a mental health crisis and how carers are able to intervene during this period, so, which basically means that, okay, when do you... When do you call the police or when do you take someone to A&E? At what point mm -hmm. is this something that needs an intervention immediately? From from um, if, if you have, yeah, just from from your thoughts, I think you have a little bit of experience with um, even when your son was <laughs> becoming unwell, you were a teacher, you were kind of like equipped, I would say, to a certain degree. Um, or you had some resources, if not experience with what is kind of quote unquote normal. Um, so any, any advice, any, any comments on that? Just how, uh, how can a carer say that, okay, this is a crisis and this needs immediate intervention? Yeah, I have a lot to say about that. And I think if you ask any carer of an SMI, they will have a lot to say about it because it is, um, a massive hole that has, uh, not been, um, we have not been given a bridge over. We, um, we are solely responsible in terms of day-to-day -day care. And uh, often the community mental health teams are understaffed. Um, they have a lot of very, very high caseloads. Uh, they might see their patient once a month to give a depot. So if you can imagine, um, psychosis raising its head uh, within the home. In our situation, there's just myself and my son in the home. So uh, in that situation, what would I do, I think is your question, or what do I know to do? Um, one of the main things that we had in our arsenal, which was quite small, was to be able to call the police in a, in a time of crisis and say, a loved one is not well. Um, to be able to call the police and for the police to act, a person needs to be at risk, at, har uh, at risk of harming themselves or of harming another. So if you're just frightened of that, that's not enough to be able to call the police and ask the police to act. Since that time, uh, and ver just very recently, some of you will know about this, the police have now been, um, have changed uh, their call out uh, kind of regulations and they will not come to anybody with a mental health crisis, no matter what kind of crisis it is, uh, unless again, there is risk to um, a life. And it's, you know, it's quite different than harm to themselves or others, it's risk of life. So in other words, suicide. So now we don't even have the police to call if we are worried for our loved one's safety, worry is not enough to be able to call out the only people we could call. So um, our arsenal uh, to protect our loved one, which is really what we want to do. Um, sure, we want to keep the community safe and we want to keep ourselves safe, but as a carer of an SMI, your focus is always on your loved one. What do we do? And uh, I think it's a very, very good question, and it needs to be looked at on um, on a political level. This needs to be looked at it on the very, very highest levels. What do we do? Who do we call? Um, how do we get them safe in a place of safety? Because the home is often not a place of safety for anybody when somebody is um, in psychosis, hearing voices. Um, 
Yeah. So you know. the I'm I'm just uh, just I was just checking an article. It's in the Guardian. It's about a month old now. That Met Police yeah. to stop attending emergency mental health calls yep. from 31st of August. Uh-huh. Um, although it does say and will only be waived if a threat to life is feared. Um, yeah. So I think I guess that that. that that point still stands that if you feel that there's an immediate threat to your life or there's you think that or there or this your the patients your the person you're caring for their own life or someone else then that should like immediately go to an emergency service uh which is 99 the mid please but it's i feel it's a blow um mm. i i used to uh, i used to work in blackpool um a few years ago about three years ago and they had this interesting program where the mental health crisis team had, uh, it had one approved mental health professional, one police officer, and one Mm -hmm. psychiatrist or some kind of like prescribing mental health professional. So they would kind of answer these calls and show up when, when, you know, when someone calls for the mental health crisis. Mm -hmm. So I thought, (laughs) I thought with time we would move towards, you know, more kind of like integration of like police and mental health professionals. And you mentioned different services like liaison and, diversion mm-hmm. um which which i think it's it's worth mentioning if if you like the the specific what the diversion service does right now well uh, in our experience um the diversion service doesn't work at all what is it supposed to do so uh diversion used to work that um you could call the police uh, they would take um your loved one into an h boss uh uh, the hospital based safety. place of safety yeah thank you yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> into into a place where they could uh, be seen by a police psychiatrist uh, usually in the cells i guess uh, they would be seen by a police psychiatrist and i've had two calls from police psychiatrists who have been absolutely wonderful they've said um listen it's it's very obvious that um your son is in psychosis we we think um you know, in our experience, we think he's probably suffering autism as well. And uh, we're going to recommend that he's taken to hospital under a section two. For anybody listening, a section two is a 28 day hold where he can be assessed. So that is a very safe and great channel that used to be operating. Um, the last couple of times that's happened, um, where my son, I I've kind of wanted to uh, utilize that channel instead of being taken to a place of safety and um, having a police psychiatrist look at them, you know, uh, properly. They have not been seen by a psychiatrist and they've been channeled through to the um, justice system. And uh, he has been held on remand for months on end. Mm. Now, this is somebody who's extremely unwell being put into an institution that does not have the facility to care for somebody who's extremely unwell. Although they they say they do. Uh They say that they have um, an outreach team from a mental health trust there. I can tell you there is no care. There is no medication. And they stopped any um, communication between me and my loved one for four yeah. months. Oh. And my son came out of that four stone lighter, couldn't use um, a bathroom, couldn't use a shower. So it hadn't showered in four months. Wow. Um, you know, it, it was the most inhumane thing that I've ever seen happen. Um, the judges couldn't get him out. I couldn't get him out. Uh, We had no support on the ground because he'd been, um, when I say on the ground from mental health services, because he'd been discharged. We hadn't been told he'd been discharged. Um, Mm. And I think uh, because the police are pulling back and because mental health services are very thin on the ground, they are discharging rather than, uh, you know, continuing care that, um, more and more our loved ones will be channeled into the um, justice system if you want to call it that Uh, and they'll be put on remand for ages and ages in these awful private prisons if the i i hope that the the liaison and diversion service or perhaps a good better version of it does still exist I'm, i'm not too well versed with all of the changes that are happening with the police but yeah i can 
under, extrapolate from that that if there's not going to answer emergency calls and that's probably heralds like a disengagement from mental health care um, yeah i think i think it is happening um that i my mp wrote to the uh, minister of justice and i did have a letter back so they are aware and i'm hoping that other carers will be doing that but i think this comes back to our carers listened to um i think the minister of health is now kind of reaching out to carers and asking for our experiences and i um i do respond to those as as much as i can yeah. and as often as i can they kind of come about once a year where you can feedback and kind of say okay <laughs> these are the main problems but the pro the problem is there are so many problems where do you start where do you um start to <sighs> empower the one person at home that's looking after probably one of the most vulnerable people in the community uh, when they're in hospital you've got a team of people and you know how difficult it is even in that environment so then try to imagine that person in isolation potentially not taking medication or potentially suffering from um, severe side effects from medication yeah with an untrained person, I'm referring to myself, relatively untrained, everything we find out about is on Google, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about uh, untrained, but um, I, I want to like hear a story from uh, from one of my friends who's quite a trained carer. So she's, um, she, so she, um, uh, so she recently got, got, got married and she's a psychiatrist her partner is a, is a psychiatrist and uh her partner also has a serious mental illness and when um when he was kind of unwell when he was going through a crisis a relapse all of that training and and still she you know she she, she did give me a call and she's like okay kind of what we were talking about before is like okay should i take him to the hospital is this okay <laughs> uh you know um he's had his medication but it's not you know it's not doing what it's supposed to do right now so mm -hmm. you know so all of the so then that the even sometimes what i'm trying to say is that the training goes out the window that person for them they're not this is their loved one this is their partner their husband yeah this is not their colleague they're not a psychiatrist or a doctor in that sense they are just mm -hmm. uh, a human being so um, I think it goes a bit deeper than that as well, that there there is some, it needs to be better understanding of the, um, what should I say, maybe facets of a carer for someone mm. who is with, um, um, who is kind of exposed to the illness, maybe if, if that's the, that's one way to put it, or yes. to the person and and is there long term? I mean, they say like like research. We were talking about this um, uh, off air uh, as well that there were, I think, thirty five more than thirty five hours a week is shown by research to start causing mental health problems in the carer themselves. So, yeah. and I'm quite sure that if you're living with someone, then you're probably going to spend more than thirty five hours a week with them. <laughs> Yeah, 25, 24 hours a day, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's such a um, a good anecdotal story uh, that you have about your friends um, being so highly trained as psychiatrists um, yeah. and yet uh, still feeling um, in deep water when um, in the home. It's, it's such a totally different experience. I couldn't imagine being a nurse on a ward. I couldn't imagine what it would be like to be in the presence of, although, you know, I have been on wards, I've been into wards, but uh, to be in the presence of so many people who are so ill, and that must be something that nobody could imagine. It's the same as being a carer at home for somebody with an SMI. You are completely alone and you are in deep water and you're paddling like mad underneath the water and trying to hold your head up and stop yourself from drowning as well. Um, there is not enough support, specialist support 
for carers of SMIs. We have generalised carer support and that is wonderful for in terms of respite. I've been on a couple of trips out to museums. Um, we get to meet other carers. It, it's not regular. It's like, kind of like once every three months or once every six months, but it gives us a little bit of respite from this just incredible pressure that we have on us to not only care, um, but to understand, to keep our loved ones on the level so that they don't feel attacked. Uh, we have to respond in certain ways. Um, and in terms of dealing with the professionals, we just seriously are not listened to. Um, I think the only people that can um, educate or help other carers are carers. Just what you said, it's yeah, peer support. And, and we shouldn't be referred to as informal carers. We shouldn't even be referred to as peers. We really are um, people that have walked through fire um, and we've become experts only through doing that. And I wouldn't wish it on anybody. I would not wish this job on anybody. You know, this is not a choice. This is something that um, we have to do. You know, to keep our loved ones alive, we have to do it, to keep them well, to keep the community well, you know, we, we want, but it's it's a lot to shoulder. And don't forget we're unpaid. Some of us, many of us have to work. Um, you know, poverty also, I think you, if you look at um, some research, poverty is one of the um, indicators for poor outcomes with mental health. And it goes hand in hand every time. Thank you for listening. This is the end of part one of the Carers episode of the Humanistic Community Mental Health Podcast. Be sure to catch part two.